Okay, so um, uh, this is the first half session of a, of a full session, so it's not long enough to where you fall asleep, and it's not <laughs> short enough to where, uh, so I can actually present something quite in depth. Um, so I'm Ryan Doherty. Uh, my initials spell out a color. I'll let you figure out what that is. And so, what I want, so this is a talk that's obviously different from everything that you're used to at these types of conferences. And in fact, this is the first time I've ever attended a non-academic uh, conference, let alone one in C++. So the reason why I'm here is mainly that I want to issue a call to action. And before I tell you what the call to action is, I want to tell you two stories that happened recently. So um, I'll talk about uh, what I've done with respect to teaching pretty soon, but I taught C++ classes essentially. And I wanted to inform the community of what I've done with C++ and how I taught and all that stuff. So when I submitted this talk to this uh, conference, uh, everyone uh, who reviewed it said that this is a great idea, but a lot of the feedback that I got was, why are you submitting this to C++ now? Why are you not submitting this to a, a conference like CPPCon or any other conference like that? Why are you submitting it here? Um, and uh, the other thing that I want to share with you is, uh, I'll talk about this more too, that I'm a researcher. So I am interested in mathematical problems that use a lot of computation, and I'll talk all about that. So I was talking with a fellow researcher about uh, her code. So her code is written in C++ and it uh, computes certain things about certain objects that we study. And one of the properties that we want to have with this code is that it runs as fast as possible, obviously. So we're very interested in optimization. So she sent me her code and I ran it with all optimizations on, O3, all that stuff. And uh, she told me it took, uh, took me this amount of time on her computer, but then when I ran it on my computer, it ran in approximately half the time. So I, I sent back, uh, so what are your compi uh, compiler flags? How are you actually running this program? And she asked me, compiler flags? What are those? So these are published results by a very experienced researcher who doesn't understand what compiler flags are. So this is the call to action. We need your help, desperately. So whose help do we need? We need help from people sitting in comfy chairs and less comfy ones in the back. <laughs> yeah, we need your help badly. And it's not, so I want this to be not just looking at um, te from a teaching perspective to beginners, but rather how are you communicating these new ideas and concepts that we're learning in C++? What are the new features in C++ 20 and beyond? How is this going to affect the majority of uh, programmers? Because you probably understand the vast majority of you are not the usual C++ programmer. Because you have to think, what are they trying to do? They're trying to solve a problem. Okay, they're used to techniques that they've learned in school. And by in trying to inject modern C++ right at the very beginning, we can easily, or at least try to, bridge the gap that exists between what is commonly taught in schools versus what is being covered at this conference. So that's the call to action that I want to issue here. So who am I? I am a currently a PhD candidate and I'm going to graduate in August and I'll be an assistant professor right after that. So at ASU, I have taught eight classes. So I've taught a variety of classes from problem solving, using Python to intro engineering to theoretical classes. But the ones that we're going to focus on today are the latest two that I've taught this past spring and the previous fall, fall 2018 which are CSE 100 principles of programming with C++. So from the title, you can see that um, this is really focused on the programming aspect. It's just that C++ is the mechanism that we can achieve 
understanding how to solve problems using uh, programming. What are the usual uh, styles that you should use? So as I've said before, I use C++ entirely for performance. So there's no other reason that I use C++ other than for performance. So I'm gonna actually say other things that'll make you instantly stop listening to me. So I don't design languages. I don't follow the C++ standard very much. I, uh, I don't write software for anyone other than myself. So I use C++ entirely for myself because it's useful. I understand what the performance aspects are how it can be so useful to me. So what do I use it for? So I use it for trying to generate test suites automatically. So we have some system and we want to automatically generate a test suite that guarantees some coverage properties. Um, and, and that's what I mainly use it for. Okay, so what about the actual class itself? So it's a first course in programming C++. So from that alone, you can think these students have never programmed before or were not expecting any programming background whatsoever. So it's the very first time they're gonna ever see programming. But it's even more than that, or less as this point says. Um, m pretty much every single concept, and we'll see what those are in a second, cover it up to and including at most C++ 98. It doesn't go anything beyond that. And in fact, from what we're going to see, the vast majority of those concepts don't even need C++. The only thing that's really needed there is the object-oriented aspect of it. It's not even truly C++ here. So this is really old technology here. And so when I looked at this and I was offered this class, um, I knew that there were more modern things that we can do here. So you may think, okay, well, Ryan, you don't use C++ very much. Um, and in addition, uh, as we'll see in a second, these, this class does not have a single computer science student in it. So you may think, okay, what, what's going on? You, you don't use C++ very much. Um, this class doesn't have any computer science people in it. So why are you offered this class at all? Twice. So the reason why I offered this class is you need to understand how ASU's computer science program works. So there are two tracks. One of them is the computer science track, and the other one is for everyone who's not a computer science student. The ones who are computer science students take the Java version of this class, and everyone else takes the C++ version. <laughs> Yeah, so, so, so that's what we're dealing with. <laughs> so, so we're trying to torture everyone who's not a C++, uh, I mean a computer science student, right? Um, so there's um, uh, three hours a week of lecture, hour a week of lab. Um, and so the lab mainly is for uh, reinforcing lecture concepts by doing additional problems. So I assign a problem to them, try to solve this using C++, and that's what they do in the lab. They go over how to do that there. So my goal was to bring this in more into the modern spotlight, as you might expect. So I taught it these past two semesters. So here's some facts about the two offerings. I had 155 students total at the very end. Um, it's not actually all freshmen though. So it's roughly a third freshman and then it keeps going down, sophomores, juniors, seniors, and two others. But as I said, zero computer science students, and a lot of them are biomed uh, people, and e much more people are electrical. So when I looked at this, I actually understood why C++ is actually offered to these majors, because electrical engineers, it's obviously needed for C++ there. For biomedical engineers, how many of you are actually biomedical engineers? Okay, so I can say this without uh, anyone correcting me. <laughs> so, um, uh, a lot of code there uh, is actually written in C++ because I'll take an example, which is protein folding. So we want to understand if we have this long protein, how does it actually fold up inside the cell? 
that involves fierce computation, and C++ is a viable candidate there. Okay, so this is what is on the existing syllabus. So this is from uh, every other offering that I've been able to discern. So why do you say like every other offering that you've been able to discern? So um, the Java version of this class, as I mentioned, there are a lot of professors there because the CS major ASU is huge. There's, I think this coming fall, around 2,000 new students, uh, new undergrads, just the CS program. So the Java version of this, class, of this uh, offering is huge. So there are a lot of instructors for these classes, I think around eight or something. So they needed to be able to coordinate across sections so that they have the same assignments, same tests, or they wanted to have the same difficulty across them. So I actually contacted the course coordinator for CSC 100 and I asked, okay, so what assignments are we gonna do? How are we gonna structure this, et cetera? And he said, you can pretty much teach it however you like. So, uh, so it, I had to actually do some digging to figure out what the class even covers. And in something in addition to this, I've never taken this class. Even though I went to ASU, I took the Java version because I was a CS student. So let's look at the syllabus for a second. So basic data types, int, double, all that stuff. Uh, very basic library functions. So like C in, C out, uh, very, very basic stuff. So uh, again, it goes up to C++ 98 at best. Uh, control structures, if else. Um, and, and loops also, uh, you can create your own functions, understanding of what scope is, built-in arrays, um, including dynamic memory allocation, uh, some classes stuff, and searching sorting. So this is what is normally covered in a 15-week class. This is what I did. So the things in uh, gray are from the previous slide, what has been covered before, and the things in black are what I covered in addition to all those stuff. You got a lot to cover. So why do you think auto is there? I, I shouldn't have to convince you of this, but why is auto useful? Yeah. It's gonna make it simpler for new beginners to write the types. Yeah, it's a lot simpler for beginners. The students loved auto. Uh, they love not having to write the type again and not having to uh, change the program if they needed to make a change elsewhere. For built-in arrays, I say kinda there. Why do I say kinda? I actually didn't cover uh, std array. It's actually to avoid the new and delete issue uh, because we don't, have, we don't want to actually have to explicitly manage our arrays necessarily. We don't want to have to um, uh, manage if we have too many things in the array and we need to double the size of the array, we don't have to manage that for us. So we use vector for that thing. Range base four, it's a lot easier to loop over something. Loop over a vector is a lot easier. Uh, pointers, why do I cover pointers? And not the smart pointer, just a normal pointer. Well, I said that we're trying to avoid the new and delete issue. What is the more modern version of a pointer? Oh, yeah, reference, but uh, but in pointer land is what I'm, I mean. It's in the print is in the parentheses. Smart pointers. So why do we use smart pointers? It, it like it. So you don't have to do the new and delete yourself. It's a lot easier to do. But why do I cover normal pointers then? Yeah, exactly. Here's another thing that you should be aware of. Students will read people's code online. They will go to Stack Overflow and they will see a potentially incorrect answer for a question. So if it has pointers in, in that question, they will copy that style and human nature is based off of habitual reasoning. You will see something and will habitually do the same thing over and over because that's what you learned. So if students see pointers in new and delete, they're going to continue using them. So if we want to bring C++ more into the modern spotlight, we want to be more sensible about this. Introduce smart pointers because they are a more modern version of pointers. So 
All these other things obviously are more modern uh, constructs. So lambdas, inheritance, all that stuff. So what is the workload? So the first semester I had a bunch of tests, assignments, labs. And then in the spring semester, I reduced the number of tests and I introduced a writing assignment. So yeah, go ahead. I don't remember offhand. Uh, if you, if we can talk after, and I can look up my syllabus. Yeah, uh, it, it's a relatively recent version. Uh, I think 2018 the edition was. But oh uh, yeah, so yeah, thank you for that. So the question was, what textbook do you use? I don't remember offhand, even though I taught the class twice. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, so uh, I'll go into uh, each of these in a second. So. What are some of the best practices that I taught? Um, I've seen examples of line, online of people returning by a Kant value, and we know that that's not a good thing to do. Or if you have a free function returning a local variable by reference, that's a big no-no, because students will try to logically connect various ideas together. So returning by a reference, I don't have to make a copy of something, so avoid a copy and return a local variable because I got to return that, logically uh, put the two together, and now uh, you know what happens there. Uh, try to avoid pitfalls if you can. So I introduce some of these concepts like new and delete, but I repeatedly say, don't do this. Only This is only for your benefit to understand that these concepts exist and you will see them, but not to do them yourself or try not to do them yourself. Use the STL built-ins whenever you possibly can. Uh, the library is built there for you. Do not reinvent the wheel, obviously. Here's something that is not, I have not seen uh, many times, but is actually very important. Indentation and curly brackets. Students are very unlikely to use curly brackets unless they absolutely must. So over and over, I have students come into my office hours and ask, what's going on here? And they have a for loop with, two things that are indented with no curly brackets. And they, they ask, OK, why is the second thing always printed? So yeah, try to reinforce the best practices that you're all used to, even if it's not completely obvious. Almost always use auto whenever you possibly can. Yeah. Is, do you think some of that curly bracket um, <coughs> thinking comes from uh, having seen Python or something? So the question is, uh, uh, does the curly bracket stuff uh, come from Python? Um, I think a little bit, but uh, again, most of these students have never seen programming before, so maybe they have seen it when they're taking this class, but I don't think it's from a habitual thing from before the actual class. Maybe it's true, I'm not sure. Yeah? You mentioned uh, things like transformable. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I have not mentioned even, oh yeah, so the question is, um, uh, have you mentioned anything like claim format? And that, uh, lo look at the syllabus that I had. There's no way that I can introduce any more. I didn't even. It could be automatically on in your helper, and then uh, in case of your sort of follow-up without putting braces, you would notice it will form up in a different way. It, it's a, so the point was, uh, you can always have it on in your editor and everything will work just fine. The problem is that, a lot of students have trouble using IDEs, so they use a, a basic text editor for that. And th they don't even know the difference between GCC and Clang or MSVC or whatever. You had a question? It, it was along the lines of that, like, do you standardize you know, how, how people are, are coding? Because I've, I've seen it both ways. Like, uh, some professors like, are like, all right, no IDEs for anybody. You know, your tests are going to be in a basic editor so that you, I don't know, get to know the syntax a little better or something like that. Yeah, so the question is, uh, do you standardize things? The first semester, I didn't, and then I paid for it. <laughs> and, and, but the second semester, I enforced that you must use this virtual machine and this editor, and so everything was a lot better. Um, but you don't want to overburden first-timers, especially with C++. You don't want to overburden them with extra things that are not related. Uh, you want to reduce the administrative overhead if you possibly can. Okay, so we have a lot to get through. Um, I wanted to 
under, uh, have students understand uh, what techniques to use to solve a problem, and we'll see those, some of those problems in a second, instead of just how to code it. Uh, use compiler flags. So I don't outright teach, use this compiler flag for this for optimization. I want students to be able to look into that themselves because there's no way I can teach all of that uh, in one semester. So in lecture, I like using a Q&A style. So how many of you have done uh, teaching in a university environment of some kind? That's the problem. <laughs> yeah, so many more people should uh, at least get this experience once. So uh, if you are using just a pure lecture style and not taking feedback from students during the lecture, I find that to be a little troublesome because some students just sit back and uh, try to catch up and even though they're falling further and behind. Doing a Q&A style helps slow down my progress on the material, but also uh, answer questions of students. Online videos. This is probably the single most important thing that I've done in these classes. So I record uh, lectures on my laptop and then upload them to YouTube. Why is this important? Because whenever you, when, when you're a university student, that is almost a full-time job, as many of you have, uh, probably can attest. On top of that, at ASU, many, many, many students have a full-time job on top of that also. And they have families and uh, issues that they're dealing with. So a lot of the times they'll miss classes, unfortunately. So having online videos helps them catch up. And because of that, they don't have to just go through the material once they can go through as many times as they want to be able to understand something fully. Doing reviews for tests is very helpful. And I periodically give handouts in class for students to not turn something in, but to practice uh, solving a particular problem. So maybe instead of doing the full assignment here, it's just like a reduced version. So maybe an example would be sum all the numbers between one and 100 to reinforce loops or something. So it's something that is really helpful. But I wanna get into something that's different. Look at this code right here. So this is actually from a, a lecture that I did. Does this code compile? Would you see, yes. I should actually rephrase my question. Should this code compile? No, but when I tried it on uh, GCC, it does compile and it does run. Uh, if I try it on Clang, it compiles and runs. If I try it on MSVC, it does not compile. So this is something that should be a red herring if you're going to be teaching uh, programming. Even simple examples like this can have different compilers disagree depending on uh, what actually happens. I believe it should not compile. The, the standard ease, I haven't looked into it. I think it says that this should not compile because what goes inside the square brackets must be compile time evaluatable. But I'm not exactly sure why this is, but GCC and Clang offer extensions or something that allow this uh, to, uh, to actually compile. So one of the things that I want you to look at is if you're gonna be teaching these things, run your code beforehand and understand if there's a difference between compilers, why there's actually a difference. This is a unique problem with C++ in that different compilers can disagree on what actually happens here. Okay, so let's just go over some of the assignments that I, um, that I gave. So I want to make assignments not about reiterating things, but to present a problem that requires the concepts themselves. So instead of saying, um, write a for loop that does this, I ask them, here's a problem that I want you to solve, uh, use any technique that you wish, and implicitly that requires some various concepts. So I'm a mathematician and a computer science student, um, so I like problems that have some mathematical flavor to them. And I want some of the assignments to be not just trivial things, but things that are require either a lot of thinking or a lot of computation to reinforce that we can use the computers for these things. So uh, 
problems about checking whether a solution is correct. So we are given a solution to a problem. How can we actually check that? So uh, if you've ever heard of Latin squares, uh, you can ask this after the talk and I can show you uh, how that actually works. But the, the issue there is that the typical solution there is to use 2D arrays. I forbade them from using arrays at all. So you have to actually think about how do I use my variables in the most effective way without having to use arrays for them? If you want to infer information about data, so if I give you a bunch of data, can you infer some information like the mean or the standard deviation or anything like that? Um, another one that I thought was really interesting is, how many of you have heard of Fermat's last theorem? Okay, so pretty much everyone. So there's actually a generalization where instead of having a to the n plus b to the n is equal to c to the n, you have four terms on the left side and one on the right side and figure out whether there's an integer solution there. A conjecture from a long time ago said uh, that there's no solution, just like Fermat's last theorem. But a paper from the early 1960s disproved that by running a program on a, uh, a Cray way back then. So what uh, I wanted students to do is just to implement this and to actually find the counterexample there. The problem is if you uh, uh, program this normally with no optimizations, it takes about a day to run. So I wanted students to be able to look at optimizations to say, oh, we can do a bit shift here and we could avoid one of the loops unnecessarily there. So you can see here that I'm not actually putting the concept into the assignment itself, but I'm enforcing the concept th implicitly through the assignment. Um, so other problems that I looked at are real world consequences. So one example is you're given a C++ file, minimize it, either uh, through the source code or from the execu uh, executable that's generated. So one uh, of the example files that I gave was, it had a bunch of endels in it. So what is an obvious optimization I can do to make the executable smaller? If I have a bunch of stood endels, what's an obvious optimization I can do? Just replace them with, with black backslash n. It actually reduced the file size by quite a bit. So, but what's another optimization I can do? I can hoist things in the functions. So by doing this, I'm implicitly enforcing that they understand how a function works. So, but at the same time, they're actually solving a real world problem here. So that's, uh, these are the things that I like uh, asking students. So what algorithms are faster for sorting things? So the two that we covered are bubble and selection sort, but also std sort. So which ones are faster? It actually turns out for certain of uh, vectors, bubble sort is faster than std sort. Anyone know which ones? It's already sorted. It's already sorted. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so bubble is faster for that. Uh, by only a hair, but it is faster. Um, and binary and uh, linear, linear search, uh, of course. So there's some other ones that, uh, it's not all about just these serious problems that, uh, that arise every day. Maybe we want to have some fun with the assignments that we do. So how many of you have heard of Alpha Bear? So if you haven't played Alpha Bear, please do at some point. It's an awesome game. So it's, it's very cute, I know. So uh, what you're given is these tiles here. And they have a letter with a corresponding timer here. And your goal is to use all of the letters before their timer runs out. So if I don't use a letter at any given point, the timer goes down by one. And if it goes to zero, then you don't get as many points at the end. So a solver here would be, look at all of the letters available on the grid, pick the best one. So th what this does is enforces students to say, oh, you can have any English word. And so it enforces looking at English words that are stored in a file, so file management there as well as how to actually uh, sort various things with sorting with another list at the same time. So if I have an array here and I want to sort it with respect to another array, how do you actually modify the other algorithms for that? 
uh, an in and out menu. So what you do there is uh, assume that all of their machines are down. You happen to walk into the store, uh, into the restaurant at that point, and then uh, you're asked to actually write uh, an application so that they can actually uh, print, process all the transactions and everything. Uh, and then in one base off a game, you have a player and an obstacle, figure out whether they collide or not. So things that are fun and interesting. But one final one that I thought would be even more interesting is look at recent versions of C++ and try to use that to improve an existing assignment that you had. So a lot of examples that students picked are const expert, um, using lambdas, uh, things like that. So, um, yeah, so these are the assignments that I had. What is this written paper that I talked about before? So I want students to understand, okay, here are the main concepts of C++, but here are the more recent stuff that this is where C++ is actually going. So what I had them do is to look at recent uh, C++ conferences and try to look at several talks and then try to summarize them and tell us what insight that they can get. So how does this affect their programming? How does it uh, change the language? How does it affect other people's programming? That sort of thing. What is actually happening with the C++ language? And I enforce that they looked at a technical talk and an apply talk, yeah. Uh, for that, how much uh, direction, if any, do you find you have to give in the beware slide where uh, so the question is, uh, how much direction do I need to give for the beware slideware category? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure what that it's is. Basically the fact that any code that's presented at any conference would be over their head. Okay. Well, no. Oh. It's simplified beyond usability in most cases without applying experience. It's all very dangerous. Yeah, so the, the point was um, that code is often much simplified uh, to the point where it's actually not usable anymore. So I actually pre-screened some talks that I think would be most useful. So the applied ones don't have very much code on them at all. And the technical ones are just at a, a, about a particular concept, like what is const expert and where is it actually used and that sort of thing. So I, I pre-screened them, but I understand the issue there. And um, of course, if this is the first uh, class, if they're a freshman, they are not really used to formal writing, so this introduces them to formal writing as well, about something that you're not quite familiar with. And uh, most students did very, very well on this. They loved this. And in fact, I had some students come up to me and I only required two talks to look at, for them to look at. Some students looked at five more because they were so, um, enthusiastic about the material and how you uh, all, when you present your talks, how enthusiastic you are about the material. So when you're presenting something, you're actually reflecting on other people and how enthusiastic they are. So what's the result? This. How many of you have read PhD comics? If you haven't, please do. <laughs> it, it's absolute, it, it used to be funny, but now it's more, this is what my life is. <laughs> so th this is the thing that I got. So I don't have the course evaluations for the spring semester yet, but I got them from the fall semester and it's pretty much all of this, that I required way too much of my students. And this is something that I felt along the way, but it's kind of like a train in that you can't really slow down very much. Um, so that's something that I want to give some insights about. Yeah, you had a question. Um, I mean, the slide that you just had mentioned debugging. So how much do you teach debugging? So the question is, how much debugging do I teach? Um, so because these are interest students, I can't get too much into it, so I can't tell them what GDB and Valgrind and all, all that stuff is. Um, the, the things that I try to mention are, try to print this variable, see what the var value is. So obviously not real debugging, but if this is the only time that they're going to get experience in the material, probably introducing debugging is a better idea, but 
there's only 15 weeks, there's a finite amount of time that I can introduce. And with this, it's already way above what is possible. You had a question? Yeah. But at the same time, if they're spending all this time debugging, a 20 minute Valorant uh, introduction could save a ton of time for them in the long run. Yeah, so the, the, the point is that um, if they're spending all this time debugging anyway, well, why not just have them go into Valgrind or any other debugging tool? The problem is that um, you can only, you don't want to introduce too many applications that they have to use, so, or too many programs that they have to run. So it's already hard enough to get them to open a text editor and to have terminal. Or in the case of the first semester, I, I had them use CLion, uh, or really any IDDE that they wish, it's already hard enough to actually install the application because some students have never installed an application before. Again, I'm not uh, assuming any background at all. So I wish I could uh, talk about debugging, but it's just not possible here. Uh, so some insights for you. So these are the things that I have garnered over the course of my two semesters that I think would be useful if you are to uh, teach C++ at least at an introductory level. Know your stuff, know it, way better than the back of your hand. Because the example, the code example I gave that compiled on one pro platform versus another, that was a result of a question that a student asked, well, what if you try doing this? So freshmen who have never programmed before ask great questions. The problem is I'm not prepared for that. So if you can understand uh, all of the ins and outs of like this, it will work on this compiler versus this one. Uh, that would be very helpful for you. Uh, keep the programming environment consistent. The first semester, I just said, use any IDE that you wish. Here's some ones that I recommend, but you can use anything that you wish. The problem is <coughs> trying to address student issues. Because what happens sometimes is that the encoding of what's saved as the file is different depending on uh, what a piece of software you actually use, unfortunately. And if you're on Windows versus Mac versus Linux, that complicates the whole thing. So keep the environment consistent. The second semester, I actually had them use the same virtual machine, the same editor, uh, had them use terminal, all that stuff to make it exactly consistent. Enforce indentation and curly brackets. Because I have students sometimes that don't indent at all and some that don't use curly brackets at all. Enforce those because we, we all know the importance of those. Do examples. So I noticed this as I was teaching the first semester that I do, um, I teach all of the theory or basically the concept itself, but I don't do many examples. I maybe do like one or two. More examples is better. Students learn by example. They don't read the definition of something. So like uh, the const keyword does exactly this. They don't read that. They look at the example and say, oh, that's where it's actually used. This is why I'm getting a compiler error. It, they're not looking at the actual definition itself. Self-restraint is important. So um, this is not just for teaching, but really in general. Um, you need to be able to self-restrain yourself. Don't go too fast through the material. Um, students will appreciate you for it, and it will cause you fewer headaches in the future. Understand what people did before you. So I talked about the previous syllabus before, that they only covered uh, a certain amount of material and I did way more. They are probably smart in doing that because it reduces the amount of work that students have to go through and so that they understand the material better because they have fewer things to actually worry about. Code examples are important, so I put this twice. Examples are important. Do examples. They learn from examples. TAs are also really important. So for those of you who are teaching or have taught university classes, TAs can help uh, pretty much break your class if they wanted to or make your class if they want to. So the labs are where they are doing examples. And as I've said, they learn from examples. So they do a lot of their learning from the labs, which is what the TAs are responsible for. 
some more insights. Don't teach bitwise. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, yeah, so I have students all the time. So I only did this the first semester and then I learned my mistake and didn't do bitwise operations the second semester. So don't teach bitwise operations if you can absolutely help it uh, because it's just too low level and too complex for them. So it's like if they see an integer single ampersand another integer, what does that actually mean? We know what that means, but students have a hard time understanding that. They don't look at integers on a bit level. They just see a number. They don't really know what the underlying representation is. They just see an integer. Um, yeah, so don't teach bitwise operations to beginners. Uh, lecture videos, as I've evangelized already, they are extremely, extremely useful. So if you're teaching, try to use lecture videos if you can. Either screen record on your computer if you can, or get an external uh, camera and, um, uh, and film yourself. They're very helpful. One-on-one -on -one help is very important. So I haven't had many students come to my office hours, but so only a few students have come, but they've come a lot, uh, pretty much every single session that they possibly can. And it helped make them pass the class because they can understand the material much easier with a one-on-one -on -one session. Even if I say literally the same words in the same tone as I do in lecture, they learn it a lot better with a one-on-one -on -one help. So take office hours seriously if you are someone who's teaching. Um, when I use tests, the way I like using tests is, here's a problem that you've never seen before. It's similar to ones you've seen, but it's not actually the same. Write a uh, code to actually solve that problem. And what I've found is that students have trouble starting. The hardest part for students to be able to code up a solution is starting. Once they get started, it's a lot easier. But understanding how to actually start is the problem. So what I recommend is if you're giving tests or examination of some kind, have tests be more short answer type questions. So like, um, does this code compile and it's like a single line or something? And maybe like if you uh, put, um, so let's just say we're assigning five to integer x and I flip the x and the five around, obviously that that shouldn't compile. So it's short problems that reinforce a concept instead of a big problem that tries to solve a problem. And the assignments are actually doing this already. So um, yeah, and putting the long types of questions on the assignments was actually well received. So if you're trying to figure out what problems you should include on assignments versus tests, put the more conceptual ones on the assignments and more uh, and less conceptual on the actual test. The ability to understand material actually increases throughout the semester. It's not actually uniform throughout the semester. So they start out not being able to understand things, but as they go along through the semester, their ability to understand new things increases. Uh, as I said before, if you're interested in some concept and you're uh, on, at some conference giving a talk and students see that, they will become interested in that. So the more help we can get from you guys, the more help that we get as um, academics. Use an IDE whenever you possibly can. It hides all of the boilerplate underneath. And I can talk about some of these uh, two things in parentheses if there's time. So what do I conclude? It, teaching programming will always be an issue. It will never go away. But if we get some interest from you guys, as well as try to bridge the gap between what you do and what we do, I think we can actually get closer to what we're uh, set out for. And I like to thank uh, these students. So I actually asked for feedback from my students to see uh, what are the things that you liked? What are the things that you didn't like? And all of these uh, students uh, sent me great, great, great feedback. And that's it. Are there questions? Yeah. So given that you said that you had 15 weeks to teach the class, and given the breadth of the syllabus that you showed us at the beginning, and given the fact that you've experienced it twice now, 
would you reduce the range of topics in order to cover more basic topics in more depth the third time you teach the class? So the question is, I had a limited amount of time, 15 weeks, and I have a, uh, a lot of material to go through. Should I reduce the syllabus? And the answer is, I don't know. Because the C++ language is cons uh, constantly changing. And because of that, I don't know because I'm not, a, I'm not one of you guys. I'm not an expert in C++. But I don't know where the C++ language is necessarily going. And so if we can get some understanding of where the language is going, then I can reduce the syllabus. I know that the syllabus should be reduced, but I don't know what things should be reduced. I, I think I, yeah. Uh, other questions as we switch. So the question is, why don't we just drop C-style arrays entirely? The problem is, as I've mentioned, students will see code online that has C-style arrays in it, and they'll try to actually copy that style because they're trying to look for help on how to solve a problem. They'll see a C-style array and copy and paste it in. So, I, so the reason why I had C-style arrays in there is that I want to have students be exposed to the material but I don't want to actually tell them, hey, use a C-style array for this, because we all, we all know the pitfalls of using them. Yeah, other question, yeah. What was the programming environment that you chose for the second semester, and why did you choose that? So uh, the question is, uh, what programming environment did I use for the second semester? What I used was um, a version of Ubuntu, and just the plain text editor in there, as well as Terminal. So, but for the first semester, I enforced C line, and that's what I used in class. But I didn't introduce, say, anything. Okay, uh, I think we need to switch, so thank you for your time.